Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all could hear me. And welcome today to a uh, discussion on fibromyalgia. We are recording this session. And I'm, my name is Dr. Uh, Jane McKay. And I am a general internal medicine specialist who happens to do quite a bit with um, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, and long COVID. So um, I'll learn how to advance my slides eventually. Um, uh, I always get into this little kerfuffle when I'm starting. So don't worry, it's all going to work. Um, to give me a minute here, I'm just going to uh, stop share for just a second while I figure out my slides again. Apologies, everyone. Um, Uh, okay. The second is I have to make sure I can um, advance and that you can see. Can uh, Just a quick, can someone just send me a, a note? Can you see my slides now? Okay, well, just a moment. Um, just, just give me a second here while I do the technical piece. Uh, Okay, um, we'll do that one more time. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, we'll start all over again here. Um, okay, now I can see. Thank you, everyone, for all those thumbs. Okay, so here I am, Jane McKay. Um, so uh, lots of letters, but it doesn't mean much. Well, it doesn't mean a lot, actually. I did quite a bit of trading, but here I am to talk to you about fibromyalgia. And really, I want to talk to you from understanding to therapy. And when I use the word therapy, it's not just, um, um, there's more to it, okay? So here we hear, those of you that were on the preamble before four, both Dr. Arsenault and, and I love dogs. Okay, so here we are in Bowen Island uh, and in the uh, traditional uh, Squamish word, it's Nochlele Juan, practice every day. Uh, we're part of the Squamish nation um, and areas such as Snug Cove where I walk my 100 pound Bernese mountain dog, uh, there is uh, used to be campsites for hunting and fishing and gathering. You still quite see quite a few of the midden beds. So I've been incredibly fortunate to raise my children and walk now my dog who, or actually he walks me, my pretty strong dog, Binky. And that's Dutch for cool dude, not soother. So let's talk about fibromyalgia. What is it? What does it occur with? Why does it happen? and how do we look after it? And questions. So the questions are from the chat, okay? So what is fibromyalgia? Fibromyalgia is a chronic, when I say cool word chronic, don't I don't like to trigger people. It's a long lasting, greater than six month disorder. It causes pain, tenderness throughout the body. Other words are used as well to describe that. Fatigue, trouble sleeping, brain fog. Now, there's other symptoms, depression, abdominal pain, headaches. Unfortunately, like many of these invisible like illnesses are often poorly understood. And I'm going to try to do my best. Here are a summary of some of the common symptoms. Muscle pain or tenderness, fatigue, headaches, digestive issues, mood disorders, uh, brain fog, some facial pain specifically, bowel bladder issues, memory and insomnia. Every case has different presentations and different amounts of symptoms, but this is these are sort of the core things we think of when we think of fibromyalgia. So I want to just put in a little understanding of why we're using the word fibromyalgia in long COVID. So long COVID uh, is really like an umbrella 
and under that sits many diagnoses. So it's not a, unheard of for viruses to trigger fibromyalgia. SARS-CoV-2 virus is responsible for COVID, can lead to both central head and peripheral nervous system issues leading to musculoskeletal neurologic uh, symptoms. And it's incredibly important, incredibly important in any illness to identify patterns and uh, um, uh, similarities early because earlier intervention means change in illness trajectory. So I always, I hear this question a lot. Why do I have fibromyalgia? Well, you know, unfortunately it's poorly understood. Uh, and because it's poorly understood by everyone, there's a delay in diagnosis, frustration, which leads to more suffering. It's an invisible illness. We, we definitely are seeing with increasing research, research that there's a genetic correlation with multiple genes avail available, involved. Sorry, There's an inflammatory, immune, endocrine, genetic, and psychosocial factors involved. There may be a correlation to how we developed as young, young individuals, ACE. Uh, and again, just like many illnesses now that we see, there is no one objective blood test. Everyone's always looking for the biomarker or blood test. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist with fibromyalgia. So how do you make a diagnosis? So this is the American College of Rheumatology uh, diagnostic criteria for 2016 that is really uh, very much a, a esteemed um, re uh, rheumatologist getting together to try to quantify a definition. So you're going to hear us saying, what is your widespread pain index? It's seven uh, and symptom severity score. Uh, your WPI, as we call it, w widespread pain index, can be seven, or and or it can be four to six with a higher SS S score, so symptom severity score. So in other words, there's a bit of a lever. Um, so there's pain and other symptoms. So sometimes less pain, more symptoms in the symptom severity means that you can still have the diagnosis. The discriminator, though which was added in 2016, is that you must have generalized pain in four out of five regions. That's a, a very important discriminator of fibromyalgia versus other complex widespread pain diseases. So we have to have the illness for three months. This is a worksheet that we use to try to make a diagnosis. So you'll see all these boxes. We, you know, so you're going to hear us say, do you have pain in your arm? Do you have pain in your leg? Do you have pain in your chest, your abdomen? So that it's really more of a checklist. And this is a working sheet for us. And again, the, the generalized pain, um, I wish I had a pointer, but the generalized pain, you have to have four out of five regions. So this is what I call the discriminator. In other words, it means it helps separate fibromyalgia out from other chronic widespread pain disorders. So symptom severity score is symptoms that occur with pain. So I wanted to point out very early, this isn't all about pain. It's about fatigue, uh, the colloquial brain fog, fatigue, unrefreshing sleep, abdominal pain, depression, and headaches. So not just pain. So here's some facts. 3% of the population affected by fibromyalgia, females three to one per male. And I suspect as many do that this is an underestimate. underestimate. This is a very costly health problem. It leads to loss of productivity, income loss. You know, when you look at other very established bona fide illnesses, diabetes, hypertension, it ha yeah, fibromyalgia has more than 10 office visits per year. Interestingly, we don't really know the natural history of this illness. So, uh, there, and that doesn't mean that it, there isn't one. It just means that it hasn't been studied. What we hear all the time in the literature that we review, a multidisciplinary model works best and uh, it's difficult to assess this. So what I like to do is say, where are the facts? Where does it 
alter in the brain. So like many illnesses, uh, it's neural inflammation. So I want to just take you through a couple of this here, a couple of these things here. So this little stripe here is the somatosensory. In other words, the feeling of, of experience of pain and touch, and it is uh, altered. The motor context, the motor cortex, the, the co a cortex involved in skilled movement, and the frontal uh, area, high uh, higher cognitive function. Uh, again, don't worry about the words. Uh, the front of the brain, back of the brain, uh, tension, spatial perception, in other words, attention, and your orientation in space. Uh, and the uh, another area, the pre, uh, I'm not going to go through the names, but it alters memory and recall. And then finally, the medial uh, frontal gyrus or front of the brain uh, or back of the brain. It's hard to know with this picture, but um, uh, development of literacy. So in other words, word finding and all those things. So uh, definitely seen. And I want to just say, Here's an MRI. This is what we call functional MRI. In other words, it's a type of imaging that's active. In other words, people, individuals in the suite are, are stimulated and then they will fire up in their brain when glucose mediated metabolism happens. So this is really just saying uh, that when you have fibromyalgia, there's more CNS activation happening, you know, and this has been around since 2002. So this is not new. Um, again, the same thing with PET scanning. So positron uh, PET scanning is a, and this is looking at glial cell activation. Remember, we talk a lot about glial cells and we talk about how those glial cells are um, active in uh, inflammatory response. And you can see in uh, positron uh, electron uh, therapy or uh, PET, I, I, I never know the actual real name, but it's a call, I ever call it a PET scan. It, it's an activated scan using glucose-based molecules to uh, that light up in terms of areas of uh, difficulty in the brain. So you see with fibromyalgia that there is more glial cell and, and glial cells really are the um, nurse cells, if you recall from those of you that have attended lectures and the glial cells really are the nurse protector cells. If they're active, that means they're breaking down, causing inflammation. So I wanna try to explain not only the cortex, so the, the brain abnormalities, but also the spinal cord abnormalities. So it, not only do you have cortex, sensory, motor, uh, memory, uh, cognition altered, but the descending, meaning the signals going down the nervous system are also altered. So in a, not only do you have the touch from the from the hand or the arm up to the brain amplified, you'll also have amplification because there is no check balance. The descending modular pathways are, are not working properly. So I want to try, this is much more of the same thing, but I, I just like to highlight, this isn't, this is really what I say is a faulty wiring system. For those that listen to me and come to me, I say, this is a faulty wiring system. So here we are, this is a nerve, and this is at the bar, at this peripheral end, and no C means pain. So those nerves there, they go into a bundle of nerves into the back of the spinal cord and up to the brain. And you can see right here, there's an alteration in the descending fibers. So this is like no, oops, sorry, no filter right? Everything's going up with no filter. So in our body, you may not realize there's a check and a balance for most everything. And in this situation of fibromyalgia, there's no check balance. The dorsal part is gone. So here we have cortex that says, oh my, I feel pain. Uh, and it's not just pain, as I just said. So when you're looking at strategies to treat this illness, it's not just drugs, um, it's also uh, non-pharmacological strategies as well. So here we go. So what do we do 
uh, first. Um, so if you've ever heard me speaking, uh, I always think of things as uh, layers. So for me, uh, sleep is fundamental and the bottom layer that has to be addressed. Exercise, and I'll talk a little bit about the strategies that get in the way. I'm gonna talk about relaxation and why, and some manual therapies before I get into pharmacology, okay? So sleep strategies. Everyone has heard sleep hygiene. All of us, uh, you know, I think it, the best thing to do is to try to develop a sleep strategy that works for you. It may not work for others, but really basically a routine approach to sleeping that is most effective for your health, okay? Everyone is different. Not everyone can do the same. But some simple things, no caffeine at bedtime, don't eat heavy foods before you go to bed, go to bed at the same time, have a creative, safe, healthy environment. And uh, this is one I struggle with, get up and then go to the bed at the same time and have a nighttime routine. So exercise and fibromyalgia, well, wonderful. Walking, stretching, biking, aerobics, yoga, swimming, great. It's wonderful if you can do it is what I'm trying to communicate. The problem is sometimes it's a struggle. And uh, one of the things I want you to understand um, is that other illnesses can often occur uh, that prevent sleep and exercise from helping fibromyalgia. And I just like to really highlight medicine, you know, because we've known a lot for a long time. So here, Descartes, Look at that drawing that he had. Here's that nerve, that wire system. And boy, in 1600s, he really got it right. So there's the stimuli, the nociceptive stimuli, uh, the fire. So what happens in fibromyalgia is you it's overactive and you get what I call inflammatory soup. And then there's more central sensitization at the spinal cord level. And then the cortex, the brain is altered. So I've, I've just taken the Descartes a picture from 1644 that says, yes, we have a nervous system and added in where the abnormalities are. So I want to introduce the concept of central sensitization syndrome. Fibromyalgia, just so fibromyalgia is an uncommon condition. Fibromyalgia continue, often can, can occur with other illnesses, ME, CFS, Lyme disease, uh, chemical sensitivity syndrome, IC, pelvic pain, POTS, restless leg, TMD, headaches, migraines, IBS. And really what is this saying is that our nervous system is really overdeveloped in terms of its sensory input to our cortex and inhibitory um, uh, response down the spinal cord. So you can, it manifests in many different other illnesses. FM is just one of those illnesses. So what can I do if sleep and exercise not working? Well, sleep, uh, we always try to help. Manual therapies uh, can be massage. Now, uh, just a word on massage. Massage is tough if you have a, something called allodynia. Allodynia means hurts to touch. So there's a whole group of individuals F with FM who have hurt to touch. And it's important to understand that massage may not be the right fit. So what are TPI I'm gonna talk about? I'm gonna talk about acupuncture pressure, prolotherapy, and other sort of manual-based therapies for fibromyalgia. So TPI, um, you know, you, you may hear us recommending trigger point injections, and that's often if there's like a myofascial or a knot-like component to the illness. And in the knot, uh, what we that happens is a needle is, in, is injected. It causes lengthening of the muscle and uh, ATP generation and removal of waste products, right? So this is what TPI does. It's a it's a 
it's not a long-term solution, but it can be a very helpful solution for individuals that are looking for manual therapies that might be helpful. Again, it's not for everyone, but it does work for some. So what can you do if you can't afford massage or acupuncture? Well, self-massage will make a difference. Acupuncture uh, can be taught through the method of acupressure. Uh, you need a couple of appointments to learn self-management. And the good news is we have groups and special lectures on this. So just check out our METV channel. And I just want to highlight Teresa Clark, who is active in acupuncture pressure teaching. Okay. So what are the cognitive strategies for fibromyalgia therapy? So I just want to put a disclaimer out there. With cognitive behavioral therapy, we aren't trying to wish away the illness with positive thinking. What we really are trying to do is target the self sabotaging or self-defeating behaviors that get in the way of effective self-management. So just so you know that the, the uh, quote-unquote grandfather for cognitive behavioral therapy is uh, Aaron Beck and Judith Beck, his daughter, and the uh, cognitive strategies, or as we use in our core group, the thought wrangling tools are really there to look at how can we best help looking at the self-sabotaging uh, tools that we have. So that would be, I can't do it, I am overwhelmed. So those kinds of thoughts, and that's um, something. So mindfulness is another important cognitive strategy. And so the gener genesis of mindfulness-based stress reduction, not the T, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy came from a group of psychologists in Massachusetts in the 1970s, 80s, when doctors said, hey, I don't know what to do anymore, can't fix your pain, let me send you to a psychologist. Well, the great news is the, those psychologists really developed an entire strategy based on basically Buddhism uh, to look at how we might be able to, uh, in the moment, reduce uh, uh, stress and pain and discomfort. So you'll see when you come to our core groups, we have a three-legged stool. One of them is CBT. One of them is mindfulness. So these are really important strategies and I can't highlight them enough. It's as important as medication therapy towards dealing with one's illness. So what about diet? Low inflammatory diet. So um, the important thing uh, we always like to talk about is what we it's important to eat uh, a diet that's low inflammatory. There's lots of cookbooks because a lot of there's so much, a lot of confusion. Really, basically, a low inflammatory diet is a Mediterranean diet or DASH diet. Some will use keto diet, but it's basically trying to uh, uh, eat foods that help your bowel work the best. So I want to talk a little, this is one of my slides on nutraceuticals because I'm not a nutraceutical or vitamin specialist, but I do like to talk about this medication because it has a tremendous impact in fibromyalgia and it's palmitil ethyl amide. And that's the last time I'm going to say it because I have a, it's a tongue twister, but it's P-E-A and P-E-A 600 milligrams twice daily can have an endocannabinoid effect. It can be an anti-inflammatory, analgesic, antimicrobial, immune modulator, and provide neuroprotective effects. It's micronized oil product, and it can be better than Ad, uh, Advil or Ibuprofen. So here it is, it's a natural product. In other words, we already have it in our bodies. And how uh, it, what it does is it goes to, it's in all of these areas, mast cells, astrocytes, brain cells, microglia, brain, brain nurse cells, oligodendrocytes, brain cells as well. It stabilizes those membranes and prevents breaking down of those membranes and release of the cytotoxin uh, inflammatory cascade that we're trying to get away from. So typically what I say is 600 milligrams, 600 milligrams twice daily, minimum of two months. 
buy it off Amazon. Uh, you can do 453 times daily. Has to be the micronized, very small oil product for it to be absorbed. And I always tell individuals it's it's available in egg yolks and peanut butter, but it's impossible to eat that quantity of food to get the supplement in. And the final thing is if you have a peanut allergy, it doesn't matter. You can still take this drug or egg allergy. So what is a reasonable strategy for medication uh, in fibromyalgia? And I think whenever we're making decisions with medications, really there's there's a sort of a uh, overarching response uh, that looks at benefit, risk, and um, cost, right? The three three sided die die that uh, Dr. Arsenal talks about. So there's an excellent excellent um, article on medic medication um, choices. It was featured on Health Rising. If you're not aware of that. Um, um, publication. It's it's well read on MECFS. So really, uh, when we look at medications, we're going to target sleep and we're going to look at neuromodulators. And when I say neuromodulator, when I bring that into my discussions with my patients, a neuromodulator is something that slows down the wires. Okay. Really simple. Slows down the wire transmission. Um, so let's go into a few medicines. So where to begin? Again, how I say it all the time, faulty wiring, immune changes, and you're looking for symptom relief. You want to know what are your wishes uh, with regards to medicine? What symptoms do you want to tackle first? And, and I have this adage, start low and go slow. Be patient and medications can take time to help. There is no one medication that will take away everything. So often we have what I call a layering effect. In other words, multiple medicines used with different modalities working together to help. Again, it's only one piece of the pie, not all of it. So um, for me, proven track record is important. I want the faulty wiring medicines that have evidence. So the first one you're going to hear from me is tricyclic antidepressants, amitriptyline, nortriptyline. So these, they're, they're kind of cousins of one another. One And nortriptyline is a metabolite of amitriptyline. Like these are medications from the 1950s. And, they're this, uh, and I'm not sure how many slides I have, but really what I usually say with the am amis and the nortriptylines, there's so much evidence for this in pain and sleep. So it's one of these, what I call two, four, in other words, two effects in one. And you usually start at a very low dose from my perspective, low is five or less going up to 10, two hours before bed. And you go to 60 milligrams. It's really important when you try these medications that you really give them a good college try. Three months is really my minimum. And uh, we have medication handouts on all of them. The biggest downside for all of these individuals is hangover, constipation, dry mouth. Those are the ones that I hear the most of. Uh, but one in three people, so that's a very good response rate, have a response in a positive way to this medication. So, you know, you may not know this, but things like the cholesterol drugs have a one in a thousand chance. In other words, this is really a good um, ratio of efficacy. So that's why, you know, I start with the basics and this is, this to me is like a foundational basic medicine. So uh, what are the others? Uh, gabapentinoids are a good option. Um, and the gabapentinoids work on the GABA receptors we have a lot of information in pregalabin, not so much on gabapentin. And again, here goes my adage, start low, go slow. So I start most individuals at 25 at bedtime, move upward. You can go from 450 to 600. Uh, it's pretty high, lots of side effects, but that's with the evidence. New England Journal of Medicine, sort of gold standard studies uh, on this. Uh, I've been published saying that very thing. 
And I, I don't think I have a slide on topiramate, but I just wanted to mention topiramate. Topiramate is the replacement for the gamma pentanoids. So if you're having troubles with the, the, the GABA type drugs, topiramate is an option. Topiramate works synergistically with uh, the GABAs, uh, but I like to use it solely on its own first. Uh, and topiramate has some benefit in that it is weight neutral. And that's something that, uh, of course, everyone uh, um, is always concerned about when they go on these medicines is one of the side effects is a weight gain. Well, then, you know, that's not right for me. So topiramate is a weight neutral option that can be used if the, if, so I don't like to, I'll be very frank. I don't like to use gabapentin. I like to use pregalabin because that has the evidence. And if pregalabin isn't working, uh, then I will, um, consider, uh, going towards a uh, topiramate if that's not right for you with the pregalabin. And just, again, we have now group medication visits. And if you look up the website and look at the group medication visits, that goes through how we make um, decisions and changes with regards to your medicines. So I want I can't go on without talking about duloxetine. So duloxetine, venlafaxine, or SNRIs, they have very strong evidence that they help with pain, physical functioning, and uh, uh, there is so there are side effects, but I really try to encourage everyone to try to do a three-month trial. And so uh, this is my success story with duloxetine. I love to share this story. I had a woman who had um, a similar illness a script or pattern, and she couldn't tolerate the 30 milligram every other day, which is what we start at. So, you know, I started her at five milligrams of duloxetine compounded. We slowly ramped that up and it made a huge difference for her. So sometimes just looking at your dosing strategies can, can mitigate some of the side effects that you're experiencing with medications. So there are lots of options. And the, um, if, if the SNRIs aren't helping, SSRIs can make a difference too. So SNRI, selective serotonin norepinephrine uptake inhibitor, SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So again, what's next? Synthetic cannabinoids, lots of evidence. Start low, go slow. Two milligrams is the max. Helps with pain, nausea, and sleep. In that category is the non-synthetic CBD THC. Um, this is my plug for uh, um, regulated marijuana uh, uh, clinics. Uh, one of the difficulties I've always uh, found with the, the pop-up stores all over the, the province now is what are you getting and, and how, how helpful is it for you? That's why I like to send individuals to clinics that have uh, a track record uh, of medical expertise and uh, a nursing expertise who can provide you with not only education, your medical marijuana license, plus your um, pharmaceutical grade product. In other words, guaranteed by the government that it's the same thing each and every time. Uh, which is not what you're getting from your um, I, quote unquote mom and pop shops that I use in my my uh, talks usually. So uh, cyclobenzaprine, I call it the house pill. I think it for muscle spasms and and relaxation. I often use it at night. It's related to the amitriptyline or triptyline. I don't normally use it together, but sometimes I do depending on the uh, clinical situation. So. Um, it's it's more of the muscle cramping um, uh, Charlie Hoy horse, if lack of a better word, drug. Um, so here's uh, more on low dose naltrexone. So you may have heard this already. Not sure. So naltrexone is this very interesting drug. Um, it is has a what we call a biphasic response. In other words. Low doses, it does one thing. High doses, it does another. So I want to not focus on what it does at high doses, but rather, what does it do at a low dose? And when we're talking about low dose, we're talking about one to five milligrams. 
So it reduces glial cell activation and it alters opiate uh, receptor blockade. And so what happens is those toll-like receptors, I don't want you, you don't have to remember the names. Basically the cell, the microglial cell does not break. And when it doesn't break, you don't get inflammatory cytokines. Uh, the inflammatory cytokines listed are the ones that cause brain inflammation. So if you stabilize that cell by acting on the toll receptor, toll-like receptor, or TLR4, they call it, it keeps that cell nice and happy. And that cell then doesn't break down and you will not get that um, uh, degranulation and, and release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And you'll get some endocannabinoid re release and you'll also get endorphin release. And that means analgesia, pain control. What are the side effects? Well, vivid dreams and nausea. And so what do we do with that? Well, we uh, typically will uh, um, compound it. If capsule is, is possible, great. If not, will you, we, had, do, we do have a very inexpensive liquid option with the recipe available on our website. So it, it, there, there, there hopefully is no barrier. Big barrier to this drug is opiate use. So opiates and naltrexone cannot be used together. So this is a drug, if you've seen our group medical visits, is the drug for people that don't like drugs, minimal side effects. So I get this a lot. Well, my pain is out of control. What am I going to do? What, can, what am I going to do, doctor? What am I going to do? Well, I think the first thing is, let's take a step back and say, what is it in my life that may have put me in a position where things have changed. So you want to address a trigger. What is that trigger? Your sleep has changed. You have a life stressor. You have a work commitment that, that's pushing you. You have a family stressor. So in those triggers, you want to modify those triggers because those triggers are pushing you and that pushing you is causing you more symptoms. So worst case scenario, I may give you a short course of tramadol good evidence. It's a synthetic opiate. Uh, it's a messy drug. I, 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 you know, I don't like it, uh, but I use it because there's evidence for it. Uh, it interacts with SNRIs or SSRIs. So you have to be careful if you're on those medications. And we, uh, I think it's really important to, to let you know that opiates are not um, an indicator, an indicated in this illness. This is not a uh, cut surgery need pain control type of situation where opiates would be best used. So is there anything else? Well, there's always something else. Um, the trouble is um, I'm, be I'm being a touch vague uh, and I'm being a touch vague, not to be coy, but to really say there's minimal evidence for the medication. If you've tried everything and and you have done all the mindfulness, CBT, sleep hygiene in the world, and your pain needs more help, there are options, okay? So uh, uh, we can talk about the options in the comments. I wanted to just highlight before I go back to the option, before I go on, there was a really nice uh, presentation done by my colleague, Dr. Indira Mahal. And if I'm not mistaken, Indivere's uh, 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 information is available on uh, the METV channel on infusions for chronic pain. And that would be uh, a really good uh, webinar for you to watch uh, to, see, to have a better understanding of what else is there. So just I just want to take, give you some take-home points before I start into the questions. You know, fibromyalgia, it's it's there, it's real, uh, lots of evidence. It's an invisible illness. There's a lot of treatment, pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic. Really, you need to have a relationship with your provider that allows you to be heard. You need a community. Community is really important. And uh, support is, is essential. Um, education and support are powerful. I've listed here a number of options. Uh, CFSselfhelp.org 
BC MEFM Society, Fibromyalgia Canada, and Health Rising. These are all um, American slash Canadian sites that might help you uh, when you're making decisions or getting needing that you need finding that you need more than just your you, you need more than just your own experience and and it's really really helpful uh and I, I i can't say enough about health rising i think this is such a well maintained site as is uh this one self css self org really well modulated and provide a tremendous amount of information for patients and um I just want to encourage you to have a look at that, okay? So I just want to take you a moment to say thank you. And now we're going to move over to questions. So in the question session, I'm going to summarize the question and give a response. So again, this is recorded, lots of information. Just listen to it in bits and chunks. That's what I usually say to most everyone. So um, let me go right to the top here. Um, so we had the dog posts for a little bit, so I'm just going to pass the dog posts. Um, uh, and, um, bear with me as I keep going down the chain here. Echo, I'm sorry. It's your slides. Uh, when you speak, I hope there, there it is. Okay. Uh, can fibro be made chain? Nadine is asked, uh, sorry, there is a question. I'm sorry, I'll take names away. So the question is, can fibro be made worse with changes in weather? So that's an interesting question. I do hear that. Um, and it changes in barometric pressure. Uh, so yes, I do hear that coming quite often. When I find it, I find a lot of questions coming up with weather and winter. And usually what I, I add to someone's therapy, if winter is making difficulties, I add a sad lamp at 2000 um, to uh, sorry, sorry, 10,000 uh, Luxors uh, for 30 minutes a day to help uh, with the, the uh, weather changes and light changes that can affect with the illness. So I have another question and that, do you need to have all symptoms in order to be considered fibro? So to make a diagnosis of fibro, the minimum of symptoms is a widespread pain, pain index of either seven or four to six and a symptom severity score, which is remember brain fog, sleep, and uh, I always have, it's terrible. I get this mixed up all the time. Um, non-restorative sleep, fatigue, and brain fog, those three symptoms, um, and then depression, abdominal pain, and uh, headaches, the symptom severity score. So you, it's all, and the generalized pain score. Those are the three scores. Do you have to have all symptoms in order to have fibro? It, what you have to have is the definition, widespread pain index of seven, or four to six, depending on your symptom severity score. And you must have generalized pain four out of five. So that's the definition. Okay, does stretching help relieve pressure? Yeah, I, and this is where the concept of massage comes in. Um, so yes, stretching in a way uh, can be helpful because you're uh, looking at um, that tightness in muscles when you're stretching. So yes, if you can stretch, that's helpful. Um, and depending on what muscle group is um, involved, yes, uh, manual stretching can help. And remember when you go to massage, like so, so for instance, if you're going to a myofascial release massage, really what they're doing is stripping the muscle anyway. So you're in by doing um, sort of active uh, stretches, you're, you're kind of in a way breaking up that, that, that myofascial connective tissue that might be, um, stuck as part of the, uh, fibro symptoms. Uh, next question. Um,
So why is it that uh, these chronic conditions occur disproportionately in female over male? Now that's a very difficult one to answer. Uh, you might want to say it's a bit of reporting bias. In other words, more, more women mention this to their physician than others. Uh, that's one possibility. I, there's also, you know, that I, I haven't dug into the hormonal impact uh, on illness. Uh, there's that per, uh, proportion as well. So there's a couple of things uh, that could could help to explain how uh, there's the female preponderance is much hot is is higher in fibro versus um, male. Those are a couple of things that I think of. Okay, my mouse is working. That's good news. For generalized pain, um, so this is a tricky part, right? So, so just so you know, uh, so there's a question for generalized pain. I have pain on both sides of my buttocks, but not in my legs. Do I check off? Yes, region four and five. And this is really where we as the clinicians, when we're the, um, uh, reviewing your story, We'll try to make an under, uh, to have a better understanding, and we use questioning to say, is it only in this area or is it in the whole leg? So you know the diagnosis of generalized pain is really sometimes if if it's only in one area, we may need to do some deeper dive questioning with regards to um, if it's more generalized uh, at some time. Um, so I'm learning all about how I can work my computer better. That's great. Um, so, so the, this is, so can you do exercise with chronic, when you have chronic fatigue syndrome? And this is actually when, when I, um, I'm doing a presentation on fibromyalgia alone. That's why I always say, why does exercise fail? Exercise fails because, you have a coexisting condition. So when you have chronic fatigue syndrome, can you exercise? Well, that's pretty difficult. And this is where I start thinking of doing the lower impact activities such as yoga, chair yoga, if you can even do chair yoga, bed yoga. And the exciting, we have a course on yoga coming up that might be helpful for those. And I think when you have a condition, uh, fatiguing condition such as chronic fatigue syndrome, and, and you have fibromyalgia, it's, it's sort of like this seesaw, right? You're, you're working on a balance. What can I do uh, to help my illness without putting me into a crash with my other illness? And that's a balance. So what do you suggest for people who also have sleep disorders and trouble with restful sleep? So I think I, the, um, so depending on the sleep disorder, uh, uh, treatment of the primary sleep disorder is always important. For instance, if you have CPAP, of obstructive sleep apnea, that needs CPAP. But CPAP in itself is not going to make your sleep restorative. It will help, um, but it's not going to be everything. So what? Uh, how do you help individuals have restful sleep? Well, this un is the unfortunate problem with this illness, is it? it is... Uh, the, the one of the cardinal features is unrefreshing sleep. So we we can't, it's tough for us to, to get you to a point of restful sleep because that's sort of the, the feature of the illness. One of the features of the illness, we can't get to sleep. And our belief is, or my belief is, if we get to sleep, even though you don't feel like you slept and you're not rested, you have had time to sleep. So to go from unrestored of sleep to restful sleep is a big jump and that's working towards recovery work. And that's more of what we would cover in our core group uh, on how to get towards that recovery work. So pain, when you're having dental procedures done, crowns, freezing, additional freezing, take longer for dental work because of pain, is this typical in FM? So yeah, I think when so this comes into the the talk topic about 
when you have to have surgical procedures, and I consider dental work a surgical procedure, you must plan these. So uh, you plan them in that you have um, rest, or you, you, you have to have preemptive rest, as we call it, prepare ahead of time, get more rest. The procedure needs to be done in chunks. So even though your dentist says, I can do this all in one X, Y, and Z, you, you need to know who you are and say, um, can I, is there any way that we can do this a little bit slower? And, and then there's post recuperative rest as well. So we do know that any surgical procedure as is dental surgery, um, you have to plan it. And so I'm hoping, so the dental program for the country has been rolled out and it's going by like decades. So I'm hoping that eventually it was going to get down that most everyone is covered. Um, so that will make a difference. Um, for ling so the second part of the question is, for lingering pain to attenuate and settle, is it typical in FM? Yeah, it can take time to settle, definitely. Uh, I also take naltrexone five milligrams to reduce sensitivity to pain, and specifically in the case of freezing and dental work. So naltrexone is one of those, what I call a long haul drug. In other words, it doesn't work as, as a preemptive. It's more of a what I call a long haul drug. In other words, you take it for long periods of time for it to be effective. So when you're having your dental surgery, for sure, uh, you would want to stay on naltrexone and hopefully it will abate some of the symptoms. So I hope I'm answering that question uh, correctly. Now, the thing, this is the only caveat. So sometimes when you have dental surgery, if you need to have a narcotic like Tylenol 3, MTEC, just stop your naltrexone and take the MTEC because you don't, the pain can be pretty significant. So just be aware that that's an important thing to consider. Next question, is allodynia also where your head is sensitive? Yes, you can have like your head sensitive as well. Uh, can allodynia occur in different degrees? Yes, some people are so incredibly sensitive uh, and it can be worse uh, and at different times of the, the day, year, um, massage, can, massage. this is where allodynia becomes a curse in a way because massage becomes impossible. And I think um, allodynia uh, or the allodynia is that uh, uh, that sense sensitive sensitivity to touch. So if you have allodynia, which is sensitivity to touch, which can vary, it's always, you know, massage is a toughie, right? Um, so you may want to gentle massage perhaps, um, but you have to not, don't go in for your typical myofascial release massage for sure. Um, do is there supplements other than PEA? Yes, there is. Now I am uh, rec I am cognizant of my limits. There is a whole bunch of supplementation. I'd like you to consider going to Dr. Morello's talks where he can go into a little bit more detail with regards to supplementation vitamins uh, for uh, nutraceuticals. I mean, I I. Um, I he he has more knowledge than I do, but there are other supplements that are available. What brand of PEA do you recommend? The only brand I really, the only thing I want when you buy MPA, a PEA, sorry, is micronized or mic, a really low um, amounts of um, uh, uh, the oil product is in really tiny little granules, so better absorption. That's the only thing I really am concerned about. Name doesn't matter. Is this PEA? Yes, we're talking about PEA. Uh, my audio is cutting out. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, what about amitriptyline for pain? Yeah, amitriptyline for pain uh, is is really good. Again, number needed to treat three, meaning third. It's, it's effective. So CBT. I have no problems with CBT, and I'm always looking at ways to learn, grow, and heal. But positive-only approaches 
where you can't flush out the negative thoughts may arise along the way are super triggering for me because of my upbringing and the actual triggers of FMCFS symptoms, which has really made me feel defeated in my ability to heal in many ways. Do you have any suggestions? Well, Absolutely. So CBT, just so you know, isn't about positive thought psychology. CBT is about um, looking at those automatic thoughts that are coming up and trying to sort of counter that. Now, when you go into a situation where your life, early life experience uh, has created what we call, what I call uh, uh, negative core beliefs, uh, you may need more work uh, if you can, uh, from psychology, uh, if at all possible, to look at the, the, the root cause, as I call it. So, uh, yes, CBT is very helpful. It's not all about positive psychology. It's actually looking at the, the distorted autonomic thought, automatic thoughts that come up from our past experience um, that can be very negative that are incredibly triggering. You're absolutely right. And if it's if it's so strong, then working on negative core belief work um, can be quite helpful. And that that's a separate domain outside of CBT, just for your own knowledge. Uh, when you're looking at um, that kind of trauma-informed care or trauma work or uh, such, that's different work. Amitriptyline helped, but cause blurry vision. Yes, it can cause blurry, blurry vision. Uh, what can I try that is similar, but won't cause the side effects? Well, um, there's a number of different agents that we can try. If amitriptyline isn't doing the kick, you're not going to want to use nortriptyline. Um, you could try it. I would probably switch up to the gabapentinoids at that point if the amitriptyline is has it having side effects. Uh, oh, well, okay. So um, I increased my LDN dose 10 days ago. I've been getting stomach aches on and off. It may mean that the dose is too high. Uh, it does cause GI side effects. I wouldn't rule it out. I, depending on where the dose you are, my standard approach is so this individual is at 1.5. I say, go down to the last dose and see uh, if that makes a difference. So er it's a spectrum, right? Everyone can have different doses that have effect. The usual I say with low-dose naltrexone is give it a good um, uh, total of... Um, you know, three months, really, if it hasn't worked in three months or, or if it's really making you miserable, just stop it, okay? It's not for everyone. But some people do have benefit at one milligram, so that would be a suggestion. Next question, would you suggest taking duloxetine in place of our current antidepressants or an addition? So this does targeting deep hip pain and or muscle pain in between your ribs. Um, so those, so two questions, really. Uh, I personally am not comfortable combining duloxetine with an SSRI. Some people do. I am. I just my worry because our population that we uh, treat is more uh, severe uh, in terms of sensitivity to medicines. So um, the SSRIs will work as well. And maybe it's looking at that prescription itself or doing a cross taper. Uh, and so hip deep hip pain and other muscle pains in your ribs are localized pain that may require localized strategies, okay? So this is where I look at localized treatments that might be beneficial, TPI, et cetera. When, where and when would be a good time to get the brain cell scan? So those brain cell scans are research-based only. So I wouldn't be able to get them for you without, uh, I don't think I, I could even get them for you here. Um, so those are research-based scans. Um, where in the lower mainland uh, would 
be a good place to get pharmaceutical cam cannabis. So I don't like to advertise, but Greenleaf is my favorite place. Uh, it's in Langley. And the reason I use that uh, facility is not because uh, I want to promote it, but rather they do a really good job. So Greenleaf is in Langley. They they do virtual work. And uh, I uh, that's one of my go-to sites. LDN, I'm at 1.5. You worked very hard to get to that dose by titrating very small. Uh, it easily triggers my dysautonomia. Will, do I need to go to a higher dose and will the benefit meet the dose? So when I have a question like this, I think, uh, so what is the LDN for? Is the LDN for uh, pain, fatigue, brain fog, uh, or... Is it for dysautonomia? Because it works in both situations. So if it's triggering your dysautonomia, that's going to cause you more symptoms. So you may want to look at a different drug combo. One is dysautonomia treatment. The other would be uh, treatment of other symptoms. So uh, that's about the best I can answer without really knowing the whole scenario. Uh, how to fix post-concussive syndrome. Post-concussive syndrome was a trigger. Doing the physiotherapy, physical therapy, neurofeedback is good for keeping symptoms at bay, but expensive. So this is the crossover. So post-concussive syndrome is a diagnosis on itself and it has its own treatment strategy. Um, is it related? Yes, it is. Because many of our patients with, with MECFS can have concussion type symptoms. But the problem comes uh, with the two is that the treatment of the post-concussion makes it difficult for the chronic fatigue syndrome. So I think it's always a balance uh, as to what works best uh, combining all situations. Um, neurofeedback is expensive. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, what is the name for medications for painful cramping at night? Uh, well, there's lots of things. So if I'm if you're talking about muscle spasm at night, so the first thing I, I usually suggest is magnesium supplementation, and the salt can be by glycinate or uh, malate. Uh, the dosing can be 450 or more above. And really the limit for magnesium dosing is diarrhea. Uh, the second is some people use quinine, so a bottle of tonic water without the sugar. So that gives you 300 milligrams of quinine. That's a, like a very old school method for night cramps. And the third treatment is cyclobenz a cyclobenzaprine. And if uh, um, there's more, there's more options that are available beyond that. Cyclobenzaprine, the house pill, remember, uh, is often for muscle cramps. What medications are helpful for fatigue and brain fog? Um, so fatigue and brain fog is really nicely uh, captured with low-dose naltrexone. That's my sort of first line in my layer of medication. Uh, and um, it will really help. It'll give you some pain relief, but more it will help with brain fog and fatigue. Now, if you're targeting just fatigue and brain fog, you might want to consider things like aripiprazole. And again, we have group medication visits that you can come to to help better understand uh, these illnesses. Which medication are which medications are best to be a POTS or MCAS as well? Okay, well. Um, uh, POTS. So with POTS, when you're looking for what I call a two four, meaning two drugs that help with one, um, POTS can, mestinone or pyridostigmine can help with POTS, but it also can help with MECFS. Uh, MCAS is a, is a different read altogether. That's a allergy related medication type treatment. So that's not going to be so much in the realm of FM. Uh, but for POTS, um, FM and POTS, um, like they're, they're not treatable 
with similar medications all the time, except at Lotus Naltrexone. That's about the only sort of crossover medicine that I'm thinking of. Uh, but other conditions such as chronic fatigue syndrome and POTS, you, there's there's uh, crossover medicines as well. So it's not an easy question to answer in a short uh, period, but it's hopefully just a, a beginning. What I would suggest you do is you attend the POTS group, the MCAS group, and then your primary disorders group, whatever that one, um, uh, whatever your primary disorders are, long COVID, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, then you want to try to look at the pain group, the um, LDN group, the LDA group. Have a look at the ten group videos, uh, group medication visits that we do that on our that are on our website. That might help you with that better understanding. Is it common for fibro severity to change? So this is a really in the menstrual cycle. Yes. So that's a really interesting question. I hear this asked this all the time. And so this is, I want to put a plug into Carolyn Lee, and she talks about hormones and pain, and she's an ops gynae, uh, uh individual that works at a women's hospital for the pain clinic. We have a lot of information on the YouTube channel about that. So just to encourage you to go there. Um, so titrating... So the question is, do you recommend a compounding pharmacy for titrating duloxetine discontinuation? Um, yeah, I do, actually. I mean, if you've been on duloxetine for 15 years in a very sensitive person, I usually go down by five milligrams at a time. And when I do that, I involve a compounding pharmacy. Now, I, I that's my personal practice. Uh, the reason that is I find it's the most gentle. Uh, for individuals that have been on the medication for a while, so that it is a little bit more costly, but again, um, it, it does help you sort of gently wean off the medicine. Is T trigeminal neuralgia linked to fibromyalgia? Well, kind of yes and kind of no. Trigeminal neuralgia is its own little beast, um, and it's um, it's one nerve focus, so it's a cranial nerve five. Uh, so that's one nerve and it has a whole treatment of uh, um, armamentarium uh, different than from that from fibromyalgia. So they're different, but similar, similar in that it's altered pain sensation. Okay. But the treatments are radically different. Uh, pain flares, some, I, I have big plain, plain fit, sorry, pain flares, after I eat certain foods. Um, hmm. So that might be the type of food that you're eating, or if you have a coexistent MCAS, uh, look at, that's what I would suggest looking into. Uh, I would, in, in situations where you're in that, a diary log, so you can develop a pattern to try to figure out, well, maybe you're just the individual that's more sensitive to a medication than another, and just uh, um, suggest that 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 would be an option to think about. Is the chronic pain group, someone mentioned doing cold plunges, sorry, in the chronic pain group, someone mentioned doing cold plunges. So how would that help fiber symptoms? Well, it's more of a generality. So, concept behind cold plunging and the whole Wim Hof movement is all about actually activating your sympathetic nervous system in a, in a, basically. But you have to realize that plunging yourself into the ocean at five, now with current ocean temperatures, 8.9 degrees around Vancouver, um, is, you know, you don't want to start it right now. Okay, if you are going to look into uh, hydrotherapy or water therapy as part of your uh, treatment for FM, um, start in the summer uh, when the temperatures are a bit better and then just work your way up. And again, it, a lot of it, it has to do with activation of parasympathetic nervous system. But you need to be really careful with, with this kind of work because there's a, there's a whole... The physiology that happens afterwards is is not so good either. So 
I do have patients that do um, hydrotherapy cold plunging, but they do it in a very, very controlled way. So, um, you know, I'd have to do some uh, deep digging in terms of research, but but I like the, the physiology and the reading that I've done is all about activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, the dopamine system. And uh, so you get a bit of a high, uh, but you also, um, uh, you calm yourself down. So it's all good, but it has to be done in the right situation. I've noticed when I go back to Croatia during the summer with an meditation diet, spending three months in the climate, my symptoms can go away um, and everything comes back with vengeance. Well, it's interesting because there's a lot of things that can happen. So if you're going back to your home environment, your, your uh, emotional stress situation is different. Uh, the Mediterranean diet, there's no question, is incredible as a low inflammatory diet. And that should be a 12 month a year thing. Uh, symptoms in Canada, uh, yeah, you can get changes for sure. And then the the um, climate temperature, the, the dryness, the wetness, all of that, um, has a play, but then you want to look at, well, what can I do to modify that? So what is it about Croatia um, during the summer? What are the factors apart from diet that you could recreate in your home environment in Vancouver? Is it a uh, sauna? Is it a, is it a uh, um, heat lamp? Is it a, is it a uh, sad lamp? Is it, so there's a lot of different things to think about. Uh, what is the difference between perineural injections, TPI, and prolotherapy? Okay, that's a big question, hard to answer all in one. So when I think of perineural injections, I'm thinking of, of uh, physician-guided um, injections of cortisol steroid in steroid and lidocaine into a nerve that's inflamed. That's what I'm thinking of. TPI is um, uh, injecting uh, into a tight muscle uh, different things, saline uh, or uh, sometimes steroids. Prolotherapy is similar, uh, but it's usually dextrose uh, that is added. So I, I just, there's, so for the perineural investigations, um, I, I would say injections, that's more of a physician-led thing. The difference with TPI and prolotherapy um, is, I, I personally would do TBI first, honestly, to tell you the truth. Um, and that that's just my personal opinion. So uh, you absolutely can take LDN when using opiates as a PRN. Uh, well, uh, Aaron said uh, you could. Um, that's fine. And maybe I need to talk to Aaron. That's great. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Uh, have you had any results with infrared? Yeah, this came up last time. Yes, light therapy can make a difference. So just so you know, um, once you have fibro, do you have it for the rest of your life? Well, the natural history is not well understood. So I can't say you're going to be, um, where you're at. 20 years from now. Um, is the goal to manage pain and other symptoms? Yes, absolutely. Um, psychosocial factors contribute to FM. So uh, the more vulnerable you are as an individual, meaning when I say vulnerable, what has happened to you, and this is where Dr. Arsenault and I talk about the ACE score. So what, what may have happen to you in an earlier life experience can alter your ability and your resilience. So that's one of the factors that we're talking about. And then any uh, stressors can occur as well. But we're not talking that, I, I want you to understand this is not a, I had a bad experience growing up, therefore I'm going to have this condition. That's not the case. We're talking about probabilities. And so, uh, that's it, you know, fibromyalgia isn't only just a psychologically based 
uh, it doesn't, it isn't because of, of that. And then that's what the point I'm trying to make. Um, I can't exercise at all. Uh, more pain? Absolutely. So this is where I say, okay, this five minute activity is not working. You have to look at, I mean, this is where I say the cross um, different types of illnesses. Um, will you, uh, so I, uh, will you be able to walk again? Um, well, let's take it a step back and look at activity, not exercise in a different format. So maybe you need to like look at activity as um, perhaps yoga or perhaps stretching. Will I never be able to walk again is, um, is a, a statement that I cannot answer because really um, to go from, I can't walk for five minutes to will I never walk again in itself is a little bit of a, a what we call um, cognitive distortion, for lack of a better word, you need to take a step back and look at how can I do activity in a different way? And then what are my goals short term? And let's work to the short term goals and try to put the idea of walking like you did in the past behind you for now. But that doesn't mean it's not going to come back. OK, so. Um, what are the difference between FM and ME CFS? Well, uh, they're two different. They're two different, but similar. Similar in that they coexist at about eighty percent of the time. MECFS is a diagnosis diagnosis made by nine symptom criteria using the Canadian consensus criteria. There is an overlap with the context of pain. FM is another criteria diagnosis, and again, con the unifying. There's a couple of unifying symptoms between the two of them: pain, unrefreshing sleep um are the the two ones that stand out in my mind uh as occurring in both illnesses okay um is the supplement 5-htp uh 5-htp is sort of a precursor for serotonin so yes theoretically it will work yes uh me cfs can coexist Uh, yeah, so the question is, why does a muscle uh, not come back so quickly? And that that can be the difficulty about um, local therapies, depending on the local therapy that you use. Sometimes it's not effective. Sometimes you need successive therapies to make a difference. So just um, try that and see. And sometimes topical therapy, topical therapies don't work for everyone. Um, I've used... I used to be quite active even a year ago, but now as I've tried to pull back and get to baseline, I still tend to get stiff burning quads that seem to become RLS at night when I do minimal stairs or the stationary bike. I have ME and FM. I've tried to get to a baseline, but I'm wondering if my legs are experiencing PEM or simply disconditioned. Hmm. That's a that's an interesting hard question to answer in a setting like this. So, bottom line, if you're doing activity and it's causing symptoms, you need to back off. Is it deconditioning? No, it, it's the illness. Um, so, if you're getting symptoms uh, from an activity that you're doing and it's causing uh, uh, lingering symptoms, you need to back off of that and think of another opportunity. And it's not deconditioning, it's the illness at the mitochondrial level, at the muscle level. Is unrestorative sleep rate related to sleep apnea without distortion? Not to my own knowledge, I haven't heard that. Um, maybe you may know more than I do, I'd have to look it up, but no, that's not my knowledge base. Perimenopause and FM. So I think, again, I look back to the hormonal discussion um, on how hormones affect uh, how we respond to symptoms. And again, I look back to the webinars that Carolyn Lee has done, but there are hormonal, hormonal changes do make a difference. And I'm not the best to explain it, but Carolyn Lee does a much better job than me. And she's got a, a, a webinar uh, on that for you. 
Uh, I have a cyst in my hand. I've had day surgery four times. I need it done again. And I don't want to go because the needle hurts so much. I asked for local anesthesic and was refused. How can I make this to get local? So, so you're having a procedure surgically where you do a, a block of some sort? Hmm. Um, I guess the best thing is to say I need to have what works for me. Um, and uh, if the cyst has come four back, back four times, my first question is, is that's four surgeries. Is, is another surgery going to make a difference? That's my first question. And the second question is you need the surgery done in a way that helps you. So there's topical analgesia, EMLA. There's uh, local analgesia. So there's uh, many, many different options. And honestly, you're, uh, the anesthetist, uh, ask for a pre-assessment clinic visit to talk to them about this. Uh, thank you. Uh, oxygen therapy. Hmm. So oxygen therapy is a bit of an interesting question. Um, the I don't recommend oxygen therapy to a certain SAT because... Uh, there's a whole lot of problems with those those home sat readers. So um, I haven't recommended oxygen therapy for fibromyalgia. I'll be honest. I don't do it. Doesn't mean there may not be a benefit from it for some, but I haven't seen that. So perimenopause, this is really a... Uh, Carolyn Lee question, can progesterone supplementation help with pain? Again, refer you back to the uh, Carolyn Lee's webinars. Uh, what do you most recommend for allodynia uh, patients? Uh, loose clothing. Um, sometimes I suggest capsaicin, but that can be really not, may not work. But for allodynia, it's a tricky, 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 tricky problem. And I'll go with the gabapentinoids for sure. Uh, with allodynia. I mean, uh, there's the the physical things that you can do, loose clothing, um, uh, less constriction, but then uh, drugs as well. Okay. How long does one need to stop LDN for gen surge? Like a day, two days. Um, are there stories of people overcoming being cured for FM? So I like to look at... Um, uh, the, the couple of websites I usually recommend to look for stories like this are uh, Health Rising, because uh, it gives stories, and the other is uh, CSF Self-Help. They have a lot of encouraging stories as well. And CFS Self-Help doesn't, .org, just doesn't look at um, um, CFS. It also has fibromyalgia in there. Is whole body fluid retention a symptom of FM? Um, not really, uh, but I mean, it can occur for many different reasons. So I don't typically see body fluid retention with FM, maybe others do, but I haven't. So I have CHF, congestive heart failure, currently taking pregalabin twice daily. Uh, I've been told many meds can't be taken with heart meds. Is PEA safe? Yes, totally. Totally fine. Totally fine. Um, uh, FYI, PEA uh, brand is without microcrystalline cellulose, which I can't remotely tolerate. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you for that piece of advice. Um, people can get good quality unbranded PEA at compounding pharmacies at a lower cost. Well, thank you for that as well. I've been using pregalvin 50 twice daily since February and haven't noticed much of an effect. I've also tried SSRIs. Should I be switching medications or trying to up? Well, again, 75 milligrams of pregalvin in the reality is a low dose. So if you don't have a lot of side effects, I'd say let's try a higher dose. Um, really, again, the study, New England Journal of Medicine, 450 milligrams, so you're ways away from that. But again, it it's dependent on what side effects you're having. Um, so that's my only suggestion. Is it okay to use Arnica menthol camphor creams? 
uh, for tight aching muscles. Yes. Yeah, so what you're doing when you're using Arnica menthol camphor is what we call counter irritation. In other words, you're tricking the nervous system to thinking that the cream that you're providing is providing uh, a little bit of harm, but it actually is providing relief. It's a, the term is counter irritation and it's been, it's known forever. And yes, it's totally fine. How long does it take for LVN to work? Uh, three months. Okay. I give it a three month trial, unless you're having really bad side effects. Is there a link between endometriosis and FM CFS? Uh, theoretically, yes. Um, what would the what would be the me best medication or action? That's a hard one for me to answer in one uh, session because endometriosis is a topic on itself. Uh, FM CFS is a topic on itself, and I don't know if you could do both together. Um, they they would require different modalities of therapy. Um, do you have any thoughts about infrared sauna red light? Yeah, we've had some uh, red success about that. So, so that's come up in the past. Is a deep pain that goes under my breasts, uh, around my side and into my back through muscles, part of fibromyalgia. Yeah, you can get some uh, chest pain and some weird radiating pains. Um, And yeah, you can you can get different pains and modifying as time goes on. Uh, it's more maybe in the realm of the whole complex wide pain syndrome as opposed to fibromyalgia itself. And but all pain, uh, when we get down to it, uh, is a neuromodulary effect. So similar therapies for the pain. Can wheat and gluten be inflammatory? So some people say yes. So there's a move towards taking wheat gluten out of the diet for some. Um, wheat in Europe does not have the same pesticides in North America. But maybe that's why Croatia is better. Who knows? I have no idea. Um, Trigeminal neuralgia and fibromyalgia is that TM is always triggered by higher inflammatory periods. And that's why it goes beyond my jaw or facial Charlie horse. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. What is the best kind of light therapy for home? Um, I'd have to look that up. Uh, it really comes down to cost and affordability in space. Um, and that one, I, I really honestly, have never, I don't have an answer for that. Um, earthing mats and uh, grounding mats and sheets have been recommended. Uh, so you're getting, someone is getting back from India and their symptoms are much worse, totally expected. That kind of travel is huge, right? So we talk about all kinds of strategies, preemptive rest, uh, post activity, post travel rest. And yes, again, the symptoms uh, vary in temperature as well, heat, and that hopefully the summer months will be a little bit easier for you, but it is pretty common to have a trigger um, of an event, making things uh, more difficult. You can rewatch this session uh, because it is being recorded. And so you will be able to rewatch it. That's, it's a great idea. Some people, it's a lot of information all at one time and you can do it in chunks. So definitely possible. Uh, so they drain the cyst is what uh, one individual is talking about, yeah with the regards to this, the cyst uh, question. COVID worsens my MEFM. Yes, that is so true. Yes. Uh, hip replacement surgery. Yes, that's going to make things worse. So when uh, you're trying to time a surgical procedure after COVID, um, you're kind of at the mercy, mercy of the healthcare system, but... I guess I'm try to to um, put as much time in as possible. And the second hip surgery, do not do it close to the first surgery. Try to delay. Um, but uh,
So having the second hip surgery um, and not going well, I, that's a, a hard one to comment on. Um, you know, it's hard to, to convince a surgeon to do something they feel might not work. Um, that may require a bit of advocacy, just so you're aware. What about guanfacine and, and with salicylate for personal care products and low salicylate foods? So that's kind of an interesting question. So that's I, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, uh, I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, theoretically, theoretically you're looking at yeah, I don't have a, I'm not even going to go there. I don't have a good answer. I'm sorry. So is there a difference? How, is there any way to differentiate between my LC, fibro chronic fatigue and POTS? Yeah. Well, you know what I would suggest is um, maybe a table approach. So POTS has its own symptoms. MECFS has its own symptoms as does fibro. And, and LC has so many symptoms. So how do you separate out all that and label what's from what uh, is really trying to articulate the primary symptoms of each disorder. So chronic fatigue syndrome has nine groups of symptoms. Fibromyalgia really has three groups of symptoms that overlap with MECFS. POTS is a dysautonomia, but it's not just, just uh, heart rate, uh, blood pressure, and dizzy. There's more to it. So I think the best way is to try to write symptoms down, see the commonalities and the differences. Hella light therapy is good. Uh, thank you. Uh, will the recording be posted? Yes, it will. Would a colonoscopy trigger symptoms? Yes, it will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Lots of thank you. So it looks like that we are at the end of our questions and it looks like we're at the end, I guess, of our, of our uh, presentation. So thanks so much everyone for listening. And this will be recorded, it has been recorded and we'll upload this and enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Thank you for attending. Okay. Bye-bye.